So this is just a, a, a gallop through some of the work that we've been doing internationally because, as I said, we do represent the International Centre of Excellence in Telecare and it is genuinely international and I, once again I do really thank our overseas visitors for coming along and supporting us and giving another dimension, I think, to what is an international challenge. Um, so, just a bit of background, a lot of background to start with on us. Um, I, some of you probably know quite a lot about us, so I'll go through that quite quickly. But I'm not sure that you have really got to grips with what our EU projects are about. And they are exciting. You know, sometimes you can be a bit cynical about EU projects. But, actually, these have been pretty good, if I'm honest, and I've been involved in lots of EU projects. Jade is the big one I'll talk about, uh, which is, is halfway through. Uh, but we've got another interesting one called Innovage, which has just started and, and actually has given us a completely new way of thinking about how we might deploy uh, telecare and telehealth at scale, which I think is really quite exciting. A bit about market size and some conclusions on what we do. I mean, quickly go through this, you know, we, we, we keep talking about this in state, and we genuinely do believe this, we, we are at that middle. It's an uncomfortable place to be, if I'm honest, sometimes, because we get pulled, and we are being pulled at the moment, I'm being pulled all over the place with trying to help set up these new academic health science networks, and if you don't know what they are, you must look them up. This is an attempt to completely revolutionise the way industry, academe, and the NHS get on, and it's very, very important. But, you know, I talk to academe and they're driven by papers. That is it, you know, quality, quantity, journals. I talk to business, driven by profits. I'm not allowed to use the word profit when I talk to care and clinicians. I did a presentation very recently where my very good friend edited it and said, take all that word out. Profit, you must not mention profit. So there we are, they're driven by patients. So we're an interesting dynamic, but we sit there and we believe that's the right place to say to, to sit. Uh, and eventually, and I think we've shown this, we will help to put products and services on the market. It will come from that interface between the A, Bs and Cs. So that's what we do. We act as that broker. We provide the opportunities. Today is a great opportunity. I hope we provided for you all. We'll do some signposting. We will do some lobby, but we're not a trade body. We don't, it's not our primary job to lobby the government on X, Y and Z. We'll leave that to ABPI, ABHI and the rest. But we do have lots of contacts. We have got, I would say, an address book to die for actually now. We've been around long enough to have some fantastic contacts. And we do have an international dimension with our EU projects. For two, three, four years now, we've uh, devoted quite a lot of our time and energy on telecare and telehealth. And we created this <laughs> audacious thing called the International Centre of Excellence in Telecare with some seed of money, so with some regional development agency money. We persuaded them that this was important and they bought it, and thank goodness they did. Because we've managed to create quite a big network now, one of the biggest networks of assistive technology organisations, companies, providers, suppliers. 2,000 contacts. We, we created three showcase sites and I'm pleased to see that the sort of what we helped to create here has evolved into something of a local partnership. That's great because we were providing that catalysis by providing sh uh, money for some showcase sites. This is the third of our Meet the Buyers. These are unique. I don't believe anybody in the country is doing Meet the Buyers for assistive technologies. Uh, it's always hard work but we always enjoy it and we always think it's worthwhile. So I'll come back next year please. Um, but when we were with Cedar, we did have some cash and we funded quite a lot of projects and you've heard the outcome of some of those projects today. Several people mentioned the projects that we helped to fund and you know we came in at the very end of, of the sort of technology supply chain so we helped to put products onto markets from sort of seven and a half to ten where ten is a market product. That's where our USP was and I think that profile that we developed led to us getting a profile internationally as being a heart of a cluster and we got invited into, well actually we've been invited to lots of EU projects but we chose the three that we're running with. So let's just look at the internationalisation of these ideas through our EU project. Jade, Innovage and a, a new one just hot off the press, CASA. And I'll spend a bit of time just describing these. But before I do, I, you know, we sometimes get very inward looking um, in the UK. And I suppose there's sort of a good reason for that because believe it or not, 
the rest of the, well, certainly the rest of Europe, I can't speak for the US, but certainly the rest of Europe does look to us as being the leaders in assistive technologies. Believe it or not, with all the problems and challenges we've got, they think we are the bee's knees, rightly or wrongly. But, you know, we are part of the European community and there is lots of policy around assistive technologies. There is the Lisbon strategy, which is a generic strategy about knowledge, uh, innovation, growth. There are specific strategies around e-health. There's one there called e-health making healthcare better. There's an ageing well in the information society. More years, better lives. And there's a, a fairly recent one, which I think is most pertinent if you are interested in these sort of things. Have a look at the digital agenda for Europe. It's got lots of boxes that we're ticking off, I think, really, in terms of using digital technology to help provide health and well-being for the population of Europe. So there's quite a lot of policy going on around this in Europe. And that's developed into research-funded projects in Europe. And we've heard about some of these already. Lots of relevance in generic funded projects, frameworks, competitive interreg. I mean, two of my projects are interreg, so there's some opportunity there. But the biggest that, that Mike Biddle, who I think he's disappeared, but he's in charge of, actually, he's the chairman of, is the Ambient Assisted Living Programme. 700 million euros? It's quite big projects, really. Uh, enhance the quality of all, uh, life of older people, use of information community technologies. Big, big budgets. Lots of projects. So, policy is backed up by funding, which is great. So there's lots of things happening in Europe. So let me tell you about one thing that we're involved in as part of this, which is the Jade project. And it's a, quite a long vision, but I think, only well, because I wrote this, <laughs> Uh, I think this is actually encapsulating where we are. So the first bit is actually about improving quality of life, living longer, independently, good health. That's about people. That's a really important vision. The second thing I think is very important as well, which is actually keeping our health systems intact. So improve sustainability and efficiency of health and social care. So that's actually critical, really, to what we're all about. And the third thing is, principally while we're all here, is to make money. The third thing is obviously about developing innovative products and services. So we've got all three things, I think, that we're all involved in, in that vision. And that is genuinely a vision. I mean, okay, I, I put that to my, t uh, my team of five clusters throughout Europe. But they all subscribe to that. They are all definitely behind that. But I won't spend too much time on this because we've seen a lot of this today. We do have the challenges. We do have the challenges across Europe. And again, these are consistent. Everything I'm saying is not my view. This is from a white paper that I had to write after a lot of consultation, doing SWOT analysis, cross analysis, every other analysis, with five major European clusters of assistive technology. So these are the common themes that come out time and time again. Yeah, OK, funding. I think it's more about structure of funding really there's no believe it or not we think we're bad there's no integration of health and social care across europe in most if not all countries so you know we, we've got problems everybody else has got problems and of course if you're in a decidedly shaky eurozone you've got even bigger problems in terms of public spending clinicians need evidence we've heard it today we've heard whole system demonstrator we've heard already that clinicians sometimes aren't persuaded by that you know i don't know what we've got to do but you know we do keep needing to have evidence, and I think we need business cases as well as part of that evidence. Yeah, uh, institutional framework. Clinicians sometimes don't get it, are not interested. I won't tell you the stories recently that I've been involved with clinicians who have never ever heard of this technology. Senior clinicians, you know, sometimes they just don't know, sometimes they don't want to know, sometimes they're obstructive, sometimes they're very positive. But it's a whole mixed bag, so there's some framework in, in there. And I think I was inspired, I guess we all were, by our Paralympic athlete this morning. She developed her wheelchair really with that direct end user involvement. And it's something that we keep saying about assistive technologies, you have to get end users involved. It can be a bit more challenging, particularly if you're dealing with people with dementia and, and difficult problems for them to express exactly what they need. But we have to take that into account. That is a major flaw. I think in terms of design, in terms of product specification, if we don't provide people with something or a service that they want, they won't buy it. That's the end of it. It will fall. And I think we've, we've failed on a few occasions recently. 
So I just want to summarise what our response to those challenges were across the whole patch, really, of our JED project. And although I, I don't know, what, what do I think about this? There was a recognition from all parties that the government has to get involved. You know, the government has to get, we have to get policies to change, to get infrastructure to change, to get government to actually embrace this on a big scale. And it can't just be the private sector. It's got to be some sort of government policy drive. And there's got to be some funding for longer term projects. I mean, OK, you can argue we've been there, we've done that, we've got the proof, but maybe we have, maybe we need more. Other constraints, and I think other things we need to address, which are the standard things we've been talking about, you know, in the last three or four years I've been involved in this, and I guess for a lot longer, is some sort of idea that we should have some universal standards, some universal platforms for collecting data, so that equipment talks to each other, basically, and the data can be collected easily and analysed. A thing that came out consistently from our clusters is training and skills. If you haven't got people who are aware, at the very least, if you haven't got people who are then trained to understand what these things can and can't do, we have a basic problem. And I think we haven't got those people at the moment, so we have a basic problem. I mean, interestingly, one thing that came out, which I was new to me, and I thought was an interesting dimension, was in France, I think, they were, they were talking about the possibility of trying to provide a, a postgraduate qualification in some sort of um, health and ICT. So if you were sort of tr a nurse, a community nurse, or even a, even a doctor, you could actually get some ICT training around telecare, telehealth, telemedicine, and that might be a completely new career path for some people which I thought was really quite challenging. And we, we, we're sort of rehearsing ideas as to how we might develop that a bit further. We've got one or two investors here today. I did a bit of arm twisting. Mm -hmm. But they've got to come in somewhere. We've got to get some private sector investment from somewhere. And I mentioned it already. I won't go on about it. Awareness and user needs is critical. And, you know, I, I'm seeing this now <laughs> full on with the cultural barriers we have between health, social care and business. We've got a few hurdles to jump there before we get that engagement that is absolutely essential to move forward with assistive technologies. And there is some legal stuff that we need to sort out, you know, in terms of if, if systems go down, you know, sometimes it can be life and death, despite what one of our earlier speakers said, I think. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just who owns what, where the data is, how we protect it, how we safeguard it. So there's, there's a lot of stuff there. And if anybody is interested, if you go on the JED website, the white paper, which I helped to write, goes into some detail on all those things. And it is quite interesting. It's, n it's certainly not a UK perspective and there's some interesting ideas. Another project, as I said, which has got us quite excited, and it's got Richard, my colleague, particularly excited, I think, um, I think we've recognised that if we are to get assistive technology out there at scale and quickly, I'm not sure how quickly this is going to work, but we need to sort of embed it in some sort of infrastructure plan. So we, we've heard about digital TV and broadband, that's great. Smart metering is another possibility. But how about starting to think about the way we build homes from scratch? Can we not embed some of these systems put a smart meter in, put all the infrastructure in, build it in a very eco-friendly way so that when you are monitoring your electricity, uh, it, it's actually not using very much, but use the smart meter to actually monitor assistive technology applications as well. So you've actually got then the possibility of everybody who's living in a house having the opportunity to access assistive technology systems and support just as part of a everyday living. So it's there, and the add-on cost for people using this is likely to be minimal. So I think this could be really quite exciting, this fusion of construction and assistive technologies. So this is getting really quite exciting for us. And you know, we've got lots of activity in the UK with assistive technology. We've got some, we're visiting the building research establishment with a party of delegates uh, uh, nearer to Christmas. So we've got some activity in smart housing, eco-friendly housing, but they're not talking to each other. As usual, we've got, we've got silos, why should they I suppose? And I think it's, it's our job to try and bring them together a little bit nearer. And I think there are some of our partners in, I think that one's got about 25 countries who are prepared to sort of bite the bullet and act as a pilot for really building some of these houses so that everybody can see how they might work.
So that's really quite interesting, that particular project. You've probably seen this um, Kaiser Permanente Pyramid several times, lots of times maybe. It's one of Richard's uh, favourites. But it does illustrate, I think, a very important point, really, that most people, it does, telecare, telehealth doesn't really matter to them. Most people are reasonably well, but some people aren't. And as we get older, we tend to progress up the pyramid and we might get uh, complex comorbidities and that's where all the money actually is spent. So how about we stop people going to the top by some sort of self-managed care. We heard about, uh, it was Tim this morning, wasn't he? All this, yeah, it was late this morning talking about prevention being absolutely critical. Well, we can use these systems that we've been talking about to prevent people progressing up the pyramid by managing themselves. Because at the moment, what tends to happen is if you get to the top, you get like the prescription for telecare. Maybe if you're very, very lucky, you might get a prescription for telehealth as well. But why don't we encourage this market before we actually get there, which is for people to just abide themselves. So there's a private sector market, I believe, where people can elect to get this stuff, buy this stuff, keep themselves in the green zone. And I think within that elective, in particular, there are some really new market opportunities. And I think internationally people have recognised that. This is a message we have been taking out to some of our partners. And, you know, we just need the infrastructure, we need the products, we need the services, we need the support. And, of course, we need that joined up at some stage to whatever public sector health care provision we have. But it needs to be seamless. I think we, you know, we are into interesting market opportunities. So that elective area is one that, again, we've been exploring for a while. We think there's great potential there. So I think that is a summary, I think, of the market opportunities internationally. So... To summarise, we, we made the case endlessly, haven't we really? Um, I think in terms of international opportunities, the policies are there. There have been some substantial and continue to be some substantial funding programmes to help us understand and develop solutions. But we're still stuck, aren't we? We've still got these barriers. There's no doubt about it. And I think until we have a a new way of thinking, a paradigm shift, really, in the way that we deliver health and social care, in such a way that in the pathways, assistive technologies is actually just part of the routine understanding, assessment and prescription, if you like, in public health. We're not going to get there. Until we actually look at trying to promote and understand elective care markets, I don't think we're going to get there. And I think finally, if we can build all that lot into the infrastructure of our everyday lives, I think we can get there. So I think there are some fairly big hurdles, but I think it's doable. And I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> we do not have a choice. We have to do this. You know, everybody's saying we have to do this. Even Cameron is really saying we've got to do this through three million lives. You know, it has to happen. Hopefully we are there to help a little bit. We will carry on doing what we're doing. We will keep carry on banging away, trying to bring people together, trying to understand markets through ICT. We'll try to bring our wonderful friends in the NHS together to talk to academia and certainly to try and to talk to business. That's a real important thing for us to do. We'll carry on running events. In fact, we've got an event coming up on October the 17th. I think there's information in your pack with James Barlow from Imperial College and myself and Richard talking about supply chains and markets in much more detail. So if you can come along to that, that's great. We're also taking the party out to Boston in October to meet with our partners in MassMedic. We have a strategic relationship with MassMedic. There's a very big e-health partnership event that we managed to get a discount for you to go to. So that's something that you can look at as well. So we're going to carry on trying to, to help by bringing people together in events and in form. We will lobby. I mean, you know, we we do get asked by biz, we get asked by the Department of Health what our view is, we try and solicit views. We will carry on doing that, particularly in this agenda. And of course, we will carry on sharing best practice internationally. I will bring stuff back, and we, found, you know, we, bring, we brought some people here from some of our projects. We will carry on trying to get the best internationally into the mix and share that with you. I mentioned a lot about Europe, and I've just mentioned MassMedic. We will start working with them 
on their best understanding as well. So I think that's me done. And it's been great to see you all. Um, hopefully we'll see you at some more events soon. And once again, thank you to Chair for looking after us so well. Thank you.